and welcome. My name is Stephen Dickens, and you're joining us on another Futurum Tech webcast brought to you in collaboration with Ripple. We're working with them on their CBDC Innovate 2023 project, and I'm joined by Arang from Exto Labs. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Stephen. Glad to be here. So tell us a little bit about your role in Exto Labs. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Exto Labs. Uh, we're a California-based uh, startup. Uh, we have been working on uh, digital payments for the last four years. Okay, so let's dive in. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing to digitize cash and how that's increasing financial inclusion. Always a great place to start from some of the brief and material I've been given think you guys have got a role to play in this. Maybe let's double click and, and give us a little bit more detail on, on, on the role that you play. Absolutely. Yeah, so we, we through our, my last startup, we came to recognize that there was a lot of uh, friction in digital payments. And um, so when we talk about digitizing cash, there are really a few attributes of cash that we wanted, we, we saw were missing from digital payments. Um, one, uh, of course, cash is free to consumers and merchants. Um, you know, digital payments have uh, have a pretty high expense for merchants and retailers. Uh, large retailers usually negotiate uh, probably better rates, but small merchants, uh, you know, it's a challenge for them. And uh, we saw that uh, this was causing even both in mature markets, we know these frictions exist, but also in emerging markets, uh, it was really causing um, sort of a, uh, even though mobile money was being adopted, you know, 10 years after uh, M-Pesa, there were a billion people using mobile payments, but still 90% of the transactions were in cash, even in markets mm -hmm. with very high penetration. And we could sort of track this to several uh, attributes. One, uh, connectivity is a challenge at times in these emerging markets, uh, even if people have you know, smartphones or, you know, feature phones, geographically, they were limited on where they could do payments. Um, they were using SMS uh, and USSD as a means of doing these payments, and that's got its own challenges. Mm -hmm. And then the fees were still high. Even um, mobile money has higher fees for, for these merchants. So we set out to try to address these problems. And uh, what resulted was a system that would allow users to uh, transact with no connectivity. So in our wallets, as we'll get into it more, we use Bluetooth. We allow them to load value onto these wallets when they're connected and then transact using Bluetooth. And we selected Bluetooth because we wanted interoperability with all mobile devices. And then when they would connect back up, uh, they would settle these transactions. And um, a whole host of issues have to be addressed, like security, how you secure this offline value, and uh, how you make these transactions robust uh, so that there are no failures, uh, because it's almost like cash being blown away if there is a you know, failure when you're offline. So, so we set out to do this for e-money, actually, when we started, you know, by connecting to bank accounts. Uh, but later, uh, the CBDC initiative started, and uh, uh, they started really asking for the same attributes uh, and features uh, that we had been focused on. So that's really interesting. What we're seeing is kind of the access to technology is very different in those parts of the world. There's very <laughs> pervasiveness of 5G is what we see from a Western perspective. But you look at the, some of the conversations I've been having with Ripple, they've had me chat to people out in the in the Pacific, you know, small island nations, some of the a really different access to technology, being able to be able to use wallets offline is a key requirement because there's not that pervasiveness of technology from a network perspective primarily. One of the interesting things that came through in the brief for me as I, as, as I got the information from Ripple was around what you've been doing with the XRP ledger and how you've been able to kind of interface with that as a technology stack. Maybe you can just double click on that for me and sort of position what, what you guys are doing from an Exto Labs perspective. 
Absolutely. Yeah, so XRP has been um, at the center of our system. The backend ledger that we've established for this system is a modified version and instance of XRP. And the motivation for us, there were several key attributes that really came uh, through the use of XRP. One was the high security that you gain when you when you have sort of these uh, distributed ledger based protocols uh, you know the wallets um, create a private key and uh, that key cannot be easily you know taken away from consumers so in most payment systems um, fraud is a big issue and challenge uh, with you know whether it's online or offline but it leads to um, enough of a leakage in the system that those transaction fees you know need to be there so with with using this edge cryptography that comes with distributed ledgers like xrp that problem gets solved of course there's a problem then of how you recover the wallet but in the case of a um, regulated you know sort of e-money solution that problem is addressable because the user has to be known and there are ways to recover that once you have an identity of the user but another very important aspect of uh, xrp was the fact that it was uh, designed to handle transactions rapidly and at very low cost and the fact that it would support a federated architecture so we adopted uh, XRP. We made some modifications to it to handle offline transactions, which meant your transactions will come in at different times, not, not all in sequence. We had to link the accounts to a user's identity and create recovery methods. Also, what we used was the fact we created a two-tiered hierarchical architecture with XRP where uh, clusters of these uh, DLTs would be used for a particular regulated financial institution to issue wallets. And then to, in order to be able to allow an open loop system uh, where another financial institution was also running their own cluster and issuing wallets, we created this interledger layer, which allows settlement between these, these two institutions. So users from bank A could transact with users from bank B, for example. And this type of autonomous, almost self-organizing um, uh, settlement system is very unique. So in a lot of uh, jurisdictions, um, you know, we, we have that in the form of real-time growth settlement systems, for example. Or if you look at India, there is universal payment interface with what they have organizations such as the National Payment Corporation of India that can handle it. What we saw was that this would essentially allow a much more um, low overhead for, for uh you know, governance uh, where this federated, you know, self-organizing federated architecture was was a lot of interest to us. We were also trying to enable vouchering for government to person payments. Uh, that's another very key thing in these emerging markets, aside from reaching uh, remote areas or users that don't have connectivity, there are big flows of government to person payments or retail remittance that comes into these countries. And uh, there were interests to be able to tokenize, use the tokenization features of a system like XRP to restrict, you know, funds for fertilizer or funds for healthcare, and ensure that you know these could be spent that way. So um, we have sort of a long list of uh, attributes of XRP that have uh, been exactly right for for the use with CBDCs. Another thing that we've done with uh, XRP is. Because we started as an e-money solution, we were linking the issuance of tokens on XRP to balances that were in bank accounts or with for unbanked users with money agents. We had already a system in place that would allow us to create tokens linked to a balance that's that's in an e-money system. When we uh, started addressing CBDC scenarios, it also allowed us to create interoperability between e-money solutions and CBDCs. And that's really critical because if you launch a CBDC system and it's a separate currency system, it can't interoperate. You're kind of you know, dividing your economy and uh, not allowing that, that uh, interoperability to happen. It's interesting. I mean, I, hearing you talk about some of the friction that's in the existing payment, and the cost for merchants and cost that ultimately gets transferred onto end users. 
one of the things I'm interested to double click on more though is the privacy and the anonymity. You talked those are sort of some of the characteristics that people want to keep, but then you've also got to know know your customer, you're interacting with people's bank accounts. Maybe just double click there for a moment and, and kind of how, how do you sort of address those kind of competing requirements, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's become sort of a hot topic uh, in terms of uh, uh, sensitivity. You know, people sort of assume that when you mention a central bank digital currency, it means the central bank is monitoring every single one of your transactions. We've actually found, you know, we, we've participated in about four different uh, CBDC competitions. We've been finalists and one, uh, one or two of them. And in these, we've seen that regulators uh, are actually very cognizant of this privacy issue. So in a CBDC system, um, the, the essentially, the if it's a two-tiered distribution model, then financial institutions really become the entities that do the KYC and um, essentially uh, the issue, you know, the onboarding and distribution of these CBDCs. In that scenario, what we've done is we've separated the KYC database and put it in the hands of regulated financial institutions, the same relationships we have today with our banks. And therefore, uh, the, the transactions are not visible to and identifiable to a central bank entity. So that's so it's an anonymity to the central bank, but KYC to the bank that you've got a banking relationship Correct. with, Correct. which is crucial. And, absolutely. And then we've actually designed the system so that below certain levels, um, there is no KYC requirement. So in those scenarios, we, we act as, as if it's a crypto wallet, effectively. So, you know, the user create self-custody and if the uh, balances and transaction limits are below a certain amount and acceptable to central bankers this can be effectively completely anonymous type system now there is another part of privacy that that's uh, also very important and that's with counterparties so in mature economies right now as much as people are concerned about cbdc privacy right now are you know, retailers or supermarkets, let's say the, the loyalty systems we tie into in our uh, retail stores, these share level three receipt data with brands, you know, you, literally every single item you've purchased is, is data that we agree to share with. So what we've done is we've made this system so that the on each transaction, there is a new account that's being used. This is visible to the issuer, to the bank, again, for KYC and compliance purposes, but the counterparties can't track you. Effectively, they're tra transacting with a new... So that's how you get the anonymity piece whilst doing KYC. That's right. Makes sense. Yeah. Now, we're looking at zero-knowledge proof signatures. And, and again, XRP is a very interesting system because you can easily replace the signature scheme. So we are looking at quantum safe and you know zero knowledge proof methods for, for doing that but it is possible with a method i described to you here however i want to bring up something which is we don't think we think that there is a new data model that's emerging and and this is a consent based data sharing model where the user decides to share data with a particular um, it could be credit risk data with a lender or it could be loyalty data to a particular brand. And what we've designed in this system is the ability for the user to say, no, I want to be private. I don't want to share any data. I want to be anonymous, but I'm willing to share my demographic data or I'm willing to share data and get something for it in return. And we put this lever in the hands of the user where when, you know, that the, the GDPR, for example, was saying, you know, trying to bring right to forget to consumers, but you have to call <laughs> sort of the data aggregator. We're, we're putting that in the hands of the consumer, literally on their wallet, where um, they can, in an atomic way, decide to, to remove this data. Because we feel that data, data is necessary for optimizing our world, and there has to be a new model for, for sharing that. We're seeing that now, that type of consent-based data model actually appear in many jurisdictions. I think in Europe, PSD3 is beginning to uh, investigate that. Uh, in India, 
There are trusted third party aggregators that are being formed for the purpose of pr protecting this type of data and making sure that counterparties can't siphon data completely. So there's very interesting opportunities where distributed ledgers um, by design can guarantee these types of uh, data sharing models. I think that's fascinating. I think the, the way you described it to me, sort of being able to do very strong KYC above a certain transaction level, being able to set some parameters so you don't need to de delve, deep, de delve deep there, but then also being able to provide that anonymity out to the users so they can that's a that's a multi level approach I think that kind of services a lot of the the not only the requirements but also some of the concerns of c b d c platforms and, and and why this may be a little retin reticence for some users that maybe it's overstated but but it's interesting i think yes yes we 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 think that um distributed ledgers uh, can can solve the data, you know, privacy problems we have out there, and uh, whether it's in the form of a central bank digital currency or as an e-money solution, they address that. I think uh, a lot of the concerns that are coming in, one has to really pay attention. You know, the notion of uh, being able to print money out of thin air, and uh, you know, cryptocurrencies. You know, I don't think we want to live in a world. You know, as we see what's going on, where we have, uh, you know, sort of uh, nefarious sort of use of uh, digital payments. And I think, you know, so I think uh, there has to be a balance between uh, between these two worlds. And uh, we don't want complete, you know, siphoning of our data where we become the product that, that we don't want to happen. But at the same time, there has to be protections for uh, for compliance purposes. Well, I think that's a fantastic summary there to wrap us up. Thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate this conversation. Thank you, Stephen. You've been listening to another episode of the Futurum Tech webcast. I'm your host, Stephen Dickens. Please click and subscribe and do all those things to boost the algorithm. Uh, and we'll see you next time on another episode. Thanks very much for watching.